Good morning uh, and welcome to uh, Bethesda Lutheran Church uh, here in Jewel, Iowa. I'm Pastor Adam Sterrett. I'm their transitional uh, intermediate or interim pastor. Uh, I could go by many names, but I'm here to help uh, this congregation through tradition, uh, transition and help them to figure out what their next chapter is. Um, we want to welcome all those who join us live uh, on, on YouTube or, or on Facebook. And uh, we want to especially thank um, Channel 14 for, for hosting us. Uh, we, we get our services posted on Mondays at 3 o'clock and on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock. And so thank you uh, and welcome to the uh, Channel 14 uh, participants. Um, <clears throat> just have a few announcements here. We are in the season of Lent, and this is the second Sunday in Lent. And the theme is peace. Um, and uh, of this week. Um, I also have a special guest uh, with us. Uh, he's not here physically, but uh, we did some creative things. Uh, Dr. David Coffin, Pastor Dr. David Coffin, uh, will be joining you uh, with a message. And we have some special music. So um, learning this new technology, we are able to kind of do, do new and creative things. And that's what we're uh, experimenting with this Lent, because or Advent, and Advent is a season of new beginnings and new hope, and that's the spirit in which we come here to worship. Um, <clears throat> just, uh, we have uh, midweek worship services, uh, and we'll be posting them every Wednesday at a seven o'clock, and we, we're doing our holding evening prayer, but we're also um, doing something new and different. We're interviewing people in, uh, in the middle of that and doing some readings in the middle of, of the holding evening prayer service. And so please stay tuned Wednesday at 7 p.m. Um, and also, um, I, I, it was brought to my attention that uh, Jerry Johnson had passed away. Um, so we are certainly going to lift them up in our prayers at this time, them and their family. I believe they're down in Arizona. And we uh, certainly want to uh, hold them in, in prayers and their, their family. So... It is with that spirit we come with a confessing heart. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from, no, from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Let us pray. Stir up our hearts, Lord God, to prepare the way of your only Son. By his coming, strengthen us to serve you with purified lives through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading today is from Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 11. A reading from Isaiah. Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. That uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all the people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their consistency is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good things. Lift up your voice and strengthen, O Jerusalem, Herald of good things, lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See the Lord God comes with might, and his arms rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd, and he will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pastor Dave can't be too safe here, so he wears two masks today during COVID. 
Today we're talking about starting all over when things fall apart on us. I have a bag of dirt here. When you have to start from dirt literally, what do you do? There's nothing. Well, guess what? When they tear down buildings, eventually they're ground down to dirt. Today, Mark has to tell a story about Jesus who loves us enough to die on the cross for our sins and be raised from the grave three days later. This Jesus had quite a life. He taught people, did miracles. He even angered people, including his family. Well, guess what? Mark is in jail. In the next room, there's lions there who are about ready to eat him the next day. So Mark took some animal skin, and he had to write about Jesus, because nobody did this kind of writing before. Again, he has to start from dirt. If you could be mad about it, or you could just start writing. Mark wrote his gospel, and other authors like Luke and Matthew built upon it. But you also are started from dirt, because God created us from dust. God created us. God saw potential in us for each one of you boys and girls. So God started from the beginning, just like Mark starts from the beginning to write his gospel. Another way to put it is, Pastor Dave has an empty scratch pad here. Again, God started from the beginning. Either you can get mad that there's nothing on the scratch pad, or you could just start writing like Mark did. Today in Advent, if you had to start from dirt or a scratch pad, what would you say about Jesus and what Jesus has done for you in your life? Today, Mark writes 16 chapters as to what Jesus does in his, in their life. And Mark has to start from dirt or he's got to have a scratch pad start from nothing. But the good news is it lasted over 2,000 years. Let's be thankful that people were willing to start from dirt or a scratch pad just so we could know about Jesus. Remember that. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the first chapter. In the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Catherine sits in her living room easy chair 
with her laptop while sipping tea and watching the holiday television programs trying to promote the purchase of more products for Christmas. Surrounded by the colorful Christmas pictures taped on the walls by her grandchildren, she wonders how much longer she will be employed. She seeks a new narrative of hope for her life. This 60-plus-year-old higher education instructor has an MBA or Master Business Administration degree with 20 years of teaching under her belt and has been notified that her contract is in jeopardy of not being renewed due to a new direction taken by the college where she has taught for decades now. Tirelessly, Catherine has promoted the narrative of higher education as a source of hope for the future. She's gone out of her way to promote higher education to all the young people and families in her community. Even after hours from her regular class schedule, a preparation time, she promotes higher education. Now at age 60, Catherine is being told that her skill set is no longer needed and the school is changing directions. Her suspicion is, is that her years of service in the college and her health care plan are overly costly in comparison to the new hirees in her school or any organization. As she sees more colleges advertise on television for younger people to get degrees, either in a brick and mortar or online campus, Catherine has doubts as to whether or not this higher education is a real narrative anymore. In the season of Advent, how do we reframe our narrative for hope in changing times with uncertain outcomes? That is, how do we start from scratch? How do we start from dirt? Mark 1 is the first gospel written in the New Testament. It's generally dated around 65 to 70 AD or CE in Rome. Mark writes this gospel in the aftermath of the burning of the Jerusalem temple by the Romans. One task of Mark's gospel is to communicate the inbreaking of judgment and the restoration of God's kingdom in the form of the Son of God being Jesus. Mark spends considerable time in his gospel depicting the shocking death of his son or passion. Some have suggested that Mark's gospel is one passion which is long with an introduction. Mark does not have a genealogy. Mark does not have a birth account or prologue to introduce Jesus as the Son of God, as the other Gospels do. To prepare during the season of Advent, this text suggests three points for us to reframe our hope in our lives during this festive yet uncertain season we find ourselves here in Northeast Iowa. First, to prepare Mark as usual in the wilderness and to test people's faith. Second, more action, less talk. Third, Mark points us toward a future which can be written by the believer. We do not let evil forces write our ending. Mark's wilderness account echoes the Old Testament prophetic voices of Exodus 23.20 and Isaiah 43 and Malachi 3.1. Mark uses the Old Testament canon or Hebrew Bible of that day to narrate the account of Jesus' ministry, death, and resurrection. The wilderness has been, play, been a place of testing of one's faith. Either they'll fall into worshiping a false idol whom they think is giving you a life, or they will not. In the opening illustration, Catherine has to let go of previous jobs in education despite her best efforts. This Advent is a wilderness for Catherine. She has done all the right things. Now she's being tested in another wilderness of losing her job. What wildernesses do we find ourselves in today here in Northeast Iowa, which make us feel less than festive during these holidays? What is it that forces us to start from dirt or scratch? In Mark's Gospel, one might just be hearing a voice of God and seeing the glimmering light of hope in the wilderness, such as John the Baptist. For 400 years of silence, 
Now that silence is broken by sin in John the Baptist. John the Baptist comes in the world like a bull in a china shop. He has no fear of speaking truth to power, no matter what it costs him, just like the prophets Isaiah and Malachi. In the case of Catherine, this is a time for her to do spiritual reflection. She may also identify demons in her wilderness from time to time which continue to haunt her. Jesus overcame 40 days and 40 nights of wilderness testing. He is the God in the flesh who provides an example for each of us here in Northeast Iowa. Unlike the prophets, Jesus in Mark is more of a person of action and less words, which is my second point. The Greek word uthus, or immediately, is used 42 times in Mark. An example of this might be Joseph in Genesis 37 through 45, the son of Jacob. After sharing his dreams with his brothers, he sold into slavery due to their jealousy, being sold into Egyptian slavery to the uh, Captain Potiphar. Joseph persists in his skills. He just keeps his nose to the grindstone doing bookkeeping. Being a member of Jacob's family with a nice coat back in Israel means nothing now. Well, Potiphar's wife accuses Joseph of sexual misconduct. Here's another setback for Joseph. He's sent to jail. Living with an influential military officer is not his basis for hope either. While in jail, he works to become a trustee and a manager of the cell blocks. Fellow prisoners promise to remember him if he interprets their dreams. Again, Joseph is forgotten and betrayed. Later, the pharaoh's options have all dried up in interpreting the pharaoh's dream in Egypt. Only then, only then, is Joseph, who started this venture at age 16, is now called in his mid-30s of age to interpret the pharaoh's dream. He is successful, and he helps Egypt prepare the land for famine. Regardless of the setbacks, Joseph stays on course. He uses whatever talents God has given him. Being Jacob's gifted son doesn't mean anything in Egypt. Joseph's hope is in his God-given abilities to do the right thing wherever he is. That is, he is following his catechism. It's a matter of action and less talk. In the case of Catherine, how does she want to reframe her hope? Will it be her job? Or maybe she wants to claim being a mother, great-grandmother, or a relative. Or maybe she might enter another field or occupation or simply open up a babysitting or daycare service for needy parents. In Mark, John announces that there is still, God is still here and God goes on with his tasks. God will continue. While John is not the Messiah, he is the one, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He does his mission, gets on with life no matter where it takes him. Jesus would do this as he died on the cross for the sins of humanity and rose from the grave three days later. In Mark, Jesus became the Messiah after he dies on the cross for our sins. Finally, Mark allows us to write our own endings to our lives. Mark's gospel is like writing an action is like watching an action movie and right in the middle of the chase of the fight scene, a blank screen, and the movie credits go up. There is no comforting closure. But you can write your own ending. As this applies to Catherine, she does not have to allow her former employer to have the last word in her life. An example of this might be the Book of Ruth. Her husband died. She's a Moabite in a foreign land. She stays with her mother-in-law, Naomi. Eventually, after much field work, she gets married to Boaz and is part of the ancestry of Jesus. Ruth did not allow the death of her husband to be the final chapter in her life. God gives us opportunities to write the final chapter in our lives in Mark. To conclude, I'm always fascinated by the story of a French family who moved to Ireland and later came to Tennessee here in America. The father sold his son as an indentured servant to pay off the family debts. Once the son was released, he did not do well in school. 
When he grew up, he became a politician with mixed success. He had many business failures and was always angering politicians in both Washington, D.C. and Tennessee. So, he moved out west to reinvent himself. There, he became a legend of mythical proportions as he fought for the state of Texas and died in the Alamo. Davy Crockett was not a great politician or businessman, but he will be forever known as king of the wild frontier. In Advent, we too have the hope in rather strange and different ways as Mark presents them to us. Let us go out and do so and be blessed in this season of Advent. Amen. Please join me in our prayers of intercession. O God of power and might, comfort your people and come quickly to this weary world. Hear our prayers for everyone in need. Faithful God, you teach us to wait for you with faithfulness and patience. Sustain and support us in our doubts and questions. Nurture our faith as we discern and enact your mission. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Loving God, you sent the stars in the sky and breath life in and breath life into the earth. Renew the face of creation where it is in need of your healing touch. Mend the wounds of environmental damage and restore balance to the ecosystems so that all creation can declare your praise. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Tender God, You know sorrow and joy alike. We pray for those in our families and congregation who are not joyful in this holiday season. Comfort those who grieve. Be a companion to all who are lonely. Tend those who are sick or struggling with depression. And gather all people in your healing embrace. Especially Sue Olson, Sherry Huber, Linda Clark, Darcy Coink, Deborah Baker, Belle Graber, Monique Bockelder, Leo Brunglum, Marsha Hove, Linda Graham, Sue Beyer, Nick Seversyke, Anna Heron, Randy Hansen, Stan Upadal, Lois Freddy, Leah Conseer, Dennis and Pat Samuelson, and the family of Jerry Johnson. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Draw near to us, O God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It is with the spirit of Advent, uh, and we want to thank all those who have been giving and continuing to to support the ministry here at Bethesda Lutheran Church. We have been receiving it through the mail and through our online giving, so thank you. It is with that spirit of of giving and offering, uh, let us pray. 
God of abundance, we bring before you the precious fruits of your creation, and with them our lives. Teach us patience and hope as we care for all those in need until the coming of your Son, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please join with me in confession of our faith found in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We will be receiving communion today. Um, for those who are watching online, uh, immediately following our broadcast today from about 9.45 or 9 to about 10.15, 10.20, uh, we will have a uh, drive-through communion, and I will have a mask on with gloves and, and hand you a sanitized uh, communion. And uh, we, we, we invite you to please drive up your, in your vehicle and come to our uh, south, um, southeast door, and I will come out and bring you communion and offer you a blessing. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. To the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and at all places offer ourselves to you, O Lord. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and he gave thanks. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and he gave thanks. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink. This cup is new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And as often as we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we proclaim him until he returns. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, how be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good, the body of Christ given for you. the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Gracious God, loving all your family with mother, mother's tender care, as you sent the angel to feed Elijah with heavenly food, assist those who set forth to share your word and sacrament with those who are sick, homebound, and imprisoned. In your love and care, nourish and strengthen those who receive this sacrament and give us the comfort of your abiding presence through the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The God of steadfast and encouragement grants you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Jesus Christ. Amen. The God of hope Fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The God of all grace bless you now and forever. Amen. Hey. 
came down that we may have love. Hallelujah forevermore. Came down that we may have light. He came down that we may have life. He came down that he may have light. Hallelujah forevermore. He came down that we may have peace. He came down that we may have peace. He came down that we may have peace. Hallelujah forevermore. He came down that we may have joy. He came down that we may have joy. He came down that we may have joy. Hallelujah forevermore. Go in peace. Remember the poor. Thanks be to God.